This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 347, recorded on July 24th, 2015. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello. And you are listening to TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. Haven't spoken to you in two weeks. Yes. Is everything well? Yeah, yeah, things are good. Uh, weather here is very nice today. Um, supposed to get kind of rainy this weekend, but... Uh, yeah, it's beautiful. Some, beautiful. Some yeah, nice, too. nice puffy clouds, 82 Fahrenheit. It's just lovely. 27 Celsius. Yep. 20, yeah, 28 here. Yeah, we have no rain till Sunday. Right. Yeah, Saturday is supposed to be nice, and Sunday it's supposed to be thunderstormy. <clears throat> also joining us today from Kirkland, Washington, Rich Condit. Howdy, everybody. How you doing? We're fine. fine. You made it half. You made it all the way to the other side of the U.S. Last time I saw you was in. London, Ontario, Canada. Right, and we boogied out here uh, where I've spent the last week with uh, my entire family. They just It just started breaking up uh, uh, yesterday. We're on the tail end of this. So that means We're headed kids for Oregon when this is over. Three, what? three kids and their kids? Three kids and their kids. So the total number is 15. Wow, you're like so almost a are, virus, man. There are t- <laughs> there are two of us, three kids, their spouses, and seven grandchildren. Wow! Wow! So it was quite a quite a gathering. How long did it take and you it, to get there from London? Um, well, because this, we were going to take our time. We're on an extended road trip here. We were going to take our time, but uh, because this uh, get together was happening, we. Um, uh, uh, scooted across the country, so I actually left the meeting a day early, right after TWIV on Tuesday afternoon, right. and we got here on Friday evening. So we took three and a half days, mm-hmm. and some of those days were long. Yeah. Uh, so since we left, we left Florida uh, over three weeks ago on the third of July. This is an amazing trip, <laughs> uh, and it's uh, I think less than half over. Okay. Wait, what's the next stop? Uh, next stop is Sun River, Oregon, where I will. You, I've broadcast from Sun River before, mm-hmm. um, so that's near Bend. It's where my wife's family has a, a vacation home, and that this is going to be our real downtime. I think we'll probably crash there for a couple of weeks. It'll just be my wife and I, but her sisters. She has two sisters that live in Bend, so there's some family in the area, and we'll just kind of uh, hang out. Hmm. Um, so, All right. by the way, it is. It has been absolutely gorgeous here. There was a heat wave the first couple of days, uh, where it was up to ninety-seven. Um, but it's been mostly uh, mid seventies today. For the first time, it's cooler, six and cloudy. That's Fahrenheit. I don't know what it is Celsius. It's got to be like what eighteen or something like that. Um, but uh, it has been gorgeous. Now, are you and it, are you on the coast? Uh, we're in Kirkland, so that is that is east of uh, Seattle proper, on the east side of uh, Lake Washington. So we aren't actually on the coast. We're okay. you know probably you know if you if you count in the sound as well because Seattle's not actually on the coast; it's on Puget Sound. Right. So we're probably fifteen or twenty miles from the from the actual coast. Uh, but there's water everywhere. Right, it's great. Yeah, it's kind of it, it, geo- geographically, it looks a little like uh, I don't know, like the Chesapeake Bay area, where you've got all these bays and inlets. Yes, exactly. It's cool. uh, it's beautiful. It's really nice. By the way, it just to check in, it's 79 degrees in Gainesville, which is yeah, pretty cool considering cool, yeah. that it's uh, two in the afternoon there. Yeah. Yeah. This episode of TWIV is brought to you by ICAC ICC 2015. ASM and the International Society of Chemotherapy joined together to bring you this meeting, which is happening in September. It's 2015's principal meeting for clinical microbiologists, infectious disease physicians, researchers, and pharmacists to help them improve diagnosis, prevention, and treatment 
of infectious diseases if you go to this meeting, which is a combination of the ICC meeting and ICAC. You can choose from over 110 sessions, 19 courses that explore major advances in drug development and infectious disease research, earn up to 31 and a half hours of continuing education, schmooze with over 6,000 professionals. That's how many people are going to this meeting. And they're from all over the world. And explore the latest products and services from over 50 exhibiting companies. You can get discounted registration rates up until August 6th. So check it out. ICAC.org slash ICAC-ICC. And I had to click the link to find this out, but it's in September in San Diego. Not, not a bad place to be. No, not a bad, not a bad place, place to be. September is the same as January in, in July, right. in, in August in San Diego, I understand. Are, are you going to this meeting, Vincent? <laughs> no, I am not. I am not. Because you and I attended an ACAC meeting. We together. did, in Chicago, yeah. Yeah, that was we, good fun. We did a TWIV with Trina Suderos, a journalist, and Mark Planche. Right. Which was that a was really good, good one. It uh, was a really good a one. I really fun. enjoyed uh, being with both those people. Yeah. Was good. Now, is com- the ICAC, has it been combined with ICC before, or is that new? Yeah, occasionally they do this. Okay. But they also do a meeting with the Infectious Diseases Society. Right. But next year, ICAC and ASM general meeting will be combined uh, going forward, and so there won't be any of these other combinations. Right. And or, that's going to be, is that in Boston? That is in Boston. And, I will have And to you get were out invited, that. and we oh. shall do a TWIV. Yes. Uh, we'll pick some interesting people. Yeah, uh, I I had to propose TWIV this year because they have a new format for getting this extra stuff into the meeting. So I proposed and it was accepted. So you got down on one knee. And yeah, I got down and I gave a ring and all that stuff. Yeah. I also want to tell you about a virology tenure track position available at the NIH. This is in the Laboratory Inf- of Infectious Diseases, <clears throat> which is part of the National Institute of Allergy and infectious diseases. That's the institute headed by Tony Fauci, who was on TWIV. This is in Bethesda, and they're looking for an investigator to study pathogenesis of human viruses with an emphasis on development of vaccines or antivirals. They would like the candidate to have expertise in virology and immunology and develop a translational research program on medically relevant viruses or virus immunology. You'll get independent resources for personnel, lab supplies and services and equipment, and you'll also have access to core research support in NIAD and the NIH Clinical Center, which I am sure are considerable. So I will put a link to uh, a further description of this job in the show notes. I'm sure some of the listeners might be appropriate for this. Gosh, I'm sure they, I I hope they get some applications. (laughs) I'm sure they'll get thousands. Yes, yes. All right, some follow-up. Uh, we had a little email conversation with last week's guest on TWIV, Joan Stites, who I'm sure you had a great time with, Rich. Oh, well, <laughs> you know, I, words do not describe this. Yeah. That was that just was awesome. That was a great, great episode. I, I listened to it just today, finally, and, and that was a great episode. Yeah, she's stupendous. She has great work, and she's really nice, too. Yeah, she is really nice. She is one of the, I describe her as one of the most conscientious people on the planet. She really mm-hmm. cares deeply about uh, everybody she interacts with um, and is just 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 wonderful. I had been looking forward to this ever since you scheduled her as a keynote speaker, which was what, almost a year yeah, ago. Yeah, that's okay? right. And it was everything I could possibly have imagined. It was just wonderful. Yeah, I'm glad she did it, and I'm also glad she hung around the meeting, too, and she yeah. interacted with people, went to sessions. You know, keynote yeah. speakers usually come and go, so I'm very impressed. Anyway, so we had a little email com- uh, exchange, and she said, I finally thought of who I wanted to have dinner with, so I did ask her and to have who, if you could have dinner with anyone, who would it be? And she couldn't think of anyone. It turns out it would be Rachel Maddow. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Which I think is a great choice. That's an excellent well, choice. You yeah, said, what uh, would that be like? Could you imagine having dinner with Rachel Maddow? It would be f- frenetic. <laughs> <laughs> There'd be a lot of hand. Yeah. So she um, said, probably it's better I didn't say this because it would have given out away my political leaning. Although we probably could have guessed it, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Another follow up Steen writes Steen is our plant virology friend whose paper we did a couple weeks ago. 
the Voine investigation concludes. And he sent the links to two uh, different announcements, one from the CNRS, which is, uh, I guess, running the the place where he is. Um, and they basically say the CNRS has completed the procedure investigating. Uh, if you remember, Voine was accused of misconduct because uh, many, many papers that he published had apparently altered figures, and duplications, inversions, and so forth. And He's the, a plant siRNA guy. A plant siRNA guy, a very well regarded guy. You know, thought to be a superstar in the plant virus field. So the commission uh, established the existence of deliberate uh, diagram manipulations in the breach in breach of the ethical standards applicable to the presentation of results. This involved modifications and duplications. Uh, erroneous captions. Such inappropriate presentation of data, however, does not amount to fabrication. These violations, which do, however, amount to misconduct, have tarnished the reputation, and therefore uh, we are taking appropriate measures. (laughs) I don't know what the appropriate measures are. Uh, So that's the CNRS. And then the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, which is where he is, conducted their own investigation, and they have a longer release where they basically say the same thing, that, you know, it was not... Fraud, it's misconduct. He he played with these figures, and that's not right. But he's fixing it. In the, thirty-two different publications, they found they found errors of sever- varying severity in twenty different ones. So this is a chronic, long-term thing. And they say, okay, he made mistakes. He's fixing it. He's retracted the papers. The data is still lead to the same conclusion. So basically they are telling us that nothing was wrong that he published, okay? And they're going to, you know, basically slap his wrist. For this conduct, Von A will receive an admonition from the president of ETH Zurich. So the guy calls him up and says, don't do this again. Don't do this again. I don't right, know. This really bothers me for some reason. It really, bothers me too. Because this is 20 papers, and you can't yeah. blame his people. Come on, if he's such a star, he should have picked this up. Yeah. Um, and meanwhile, um, so I, on Twitter, I follow a lot of other science journalists, and, and one of them, Leonid Schneider, um, was uh, looking into this, apparently trying to get more information on the what was done in this investigation. And the press office at ETH Zurich informed him that the investigation itself is a federal secret, so yeah. asking for information about it would subject him to prosecution. Can he file a freedom of information? Which is, first of all, not a credible claim in any modern democracy. Yeah. I don't know Swiss laws, but I just cannot believe that that could be the case, that you can tell a journalist you're not even allowed to ask questions. Yeah. Um, secondly, it is a phenomenally stupid thing for a press office to do. They ought to know better. Yeah. I mean, you tell a journalist, oh, no, you, you can't ask questions about this. Um, that's pretty much guarantees there's going to be a story. Hmm. So <laughs> maybe there's something here that we're not. That we're I not don't know. About. I don't know quite what's going on, and and they don't want to tell anybody what is going on beyond this, except well, um, you know. I mean, it's an statement. internal investigation, right? Yeah. So um, it would really be nice. It would really be nice to see the results of a an investigation that was not an internal investigation. Sure. Yes. I mean, if this happened, if what would ha- what. What would happen in a similar situation in the U.S.? Um, the so the NIH. Um, it, let's assume it's an NIH researcher. That's a good right. analogy. Um, NIH would do an internal investigation, um, but this would also be handled potentially as a case of federal fraud. Mm-hmm. Um, so it can be investigated by you know any of the federal authorities and. Um, uh, oh, I, there's a there's an office that does this sort of thing, and I'm blanking on their on their name. But um, yeah, so there'd be the the investigations would be done at the NIH and also at uh, potentially by other federal arms of the federal government um, in the context of investigating whether somebody committed fraud with grant money, because hmm. that would be the the charge. Um, Usually what this ends up in uh, with uh, 
is is HHS issuing something like, depending on the severity of the offense, either they permanently ban that person from receiving government funding for future research, or they ban them from receiving funding for a period of time. Uh, there may be a probationary period where they require that uh, they, at any time somebody this this person is doing research on a federal grant, they have to be monitored by somebody else um, to make sure that they're that they're doing it right. Um, so there are a variety of sanctions that can be put into place, and generally, all of this is um, is published in the uh, Federal Register. Hmm. Yeah. So this uh, second link that uh, you had in here reporting on this, Vincent, uh, th describes some of the measures, and I read through them, I don't remember in, uh, in detail, but basically what it amounts to is having, uh, some of the measures amount to having people outside his lab right. sort of overseeing uh, some, of, uh, some of what he's doing to make sure that this sort of thing doesn't happen again, at least in the short term. He's, mm. he's being educated Okay, yes. on how to report his science uh, without doing this sort of thing. I don't know. How, um, I don't know how he would ever get to the point of doing this for twenty papers. It's just ridiculous. Yeah, I, uh, I, I. No matter, no matter what uh, sort of disciplinary action is being taken or whatever, uh, I want our listeners to know that this is not how science is done. No. Okay, you don't mess with the data. Okay, and this is, I, I, I have a hard time believing that this is just a simple matter of, oh, I wasn't paying enough attention, okay? Um, yeah, you I just, the, the data are the data, and you uh, consider them as they are, you report them as they are. You don't mess around with figures and that kind of stuff, even just to make it look pretty if the answer is, uh, if, the, if it doesn't make any difference to the answer. You report the data you get. <clears throat> and actually, you know, there's a way of doing science that, that the way I have done it I'm, I'm, do I have to use the past tense? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to use present perfect for the time being. The way I have done it and the way I taught my students is they, my students seem to come in and they used to, they, they came in with the attitude as if um, uh, every ex experiment you're going to do is the experiment you're going to publish. Okay, mm. and so they were always trying to do the experiment that you're going to publish. And to me, that's not the way it's done. The way it's done is that you mess around for like months, doing experiments and doing experiments and more experiments and more experiments until you yourself understand the problem and you think you understand the answer, and then you do the experiment that's going to demonstrate what you have in your head. Okay, it's like everything else is practice, and then you go to concert, and you do that experiment, and of course something screws up and the gel cracks and that kind of stuff. So what do you do? <laughs> you don't mess around with it. You do the experiment again and again and again until you get it just right, and that's the thing you publish. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think something's going on here, and um, I don't know. I mean, he's got a problem. I think. Yeah, yeah, and I think so too. even even this uh, supposedly benign thing of beautifying a figure, that's that that's not something that happens through inattention. Right, right. right? Yeah. That's that, that's a sin of commission. You had to actually yeah. do something to it. Right. The the inattention would be you publish the sloppy figure. Yeah. Right? right. And this is right. That's not what anybody's saying happened here, and. Uh, it, so it's just very disturbing. I mean, the so, chronic nature of this indicates that, and he, it's his lab, he's responsible. Yeah. You know, it's not just an isolated mistake. It happened over right. and over again. This was intentional. And so what concerns me is that is that people uh, who work with him are learning right. that this is the way it's done. Right. And the institution, in taking the action that it's taking, is essentially condoning this sort of activity. And, and I, uh-uh. And the journals that published this stuff are now sitting there saying, "Did we publish bad science?" Um, you know, and and if you're publishing papers like that, and people are looking at at them and saying, "Wow, that's what it takes to get published," um, you are encouraging more of this sort of behavior as well. So, uh, Caleb and others out there in Twiveland, <laughs> yes, this is, not the, this is not the way you do this. Not at yeah. All. 
not at all. I'm very unhappy at the solution here. I would have yeah. not done this. I would have been much, much more severe. And, and I don't know what other... Uh, I, there may be other investigations that, that get done. Maybe, I don't maybe. know if there's a Swiss government procedure for this, but anyway, not very satisfactory where it stands. We have an email on this topic from Drake. Can you read that, Alan? Sure. Drake writes, Hello, professors. Dr. Dove qualifies in my book. Why, thank you. Are you tenured, oh, Alan? I... I <laughs> Don't think there is such a thing for freelance science firms. <laughs> you know, uh, Condit's a freelance professor now. That's what he told He's us. He's a freelance so. professor, well, yes. I'm a that. freelance virologist, yeah. <laughs> um, to continue with Drake's, Drake's letter, all of you seem to be confused as to why someone would falsify data. I want to bring up one more motivating factor that you failed to mention. Too many graduate students and postdocs are put in situations where they are desperate and see no other way out unless they get the results that keep the principal investigator happy. The situation is often more dire for those that come from different countries. I've met a postdoc that worked three years on a project, but the principal investigator refused to publish any of the results because the in vivo data were not substantial enough to warrant a high-impact publication. The postdoc had to leave the lab without a publication or start another project from scratch. I know a fifth-year PhD student who was told to get results by the end of the month or they would be fired. I am sure many listeners know of similar stories. It is unfortunate that not all investigators treat those beneath them with respect and understanding. Thanks for all the effort you put into educating the public. I don't think we were confused. We just were <laughs> incredulous that anyone would do this. We, uh, we understand that there are many, many motivators for committing fraud. But um, in my view, you know, you should, if your PI tells you falsify the data, you quit. You go somewhere else, and you well, report him I, or her, right? Yeah, but I think Drake raises a good point um, that the the power structure in some labs is such that, especially for a student whose uh, whose uh, visa in their country where they're working is dependent on working in that lab, um, this there there's a there is a real potential for abuse here. I understand, but you cannot use that as a reason for falsifying data. Well, you cannot. No, you no, have to no, find no. someone to report this behavior to. Yes. Yeah. It doesn't excuse. Um, yeah. Say, saying you were only following orders does not excuse bad behavior, as we all know. Um, Unless you're in the army. Well, even then. <laughs> um, but uh, it, it does. It does color the the situation where you might say, okay, yes, the the student or the postdoc would be at fault in that case, but the PI certainly bears hmm. substantial blame for pressuring them to do it. By the way, I'm not I, I'm not I'm not confused and I'm not even incredulous. I'm just really disappointed. Yeah, yes. That's a good that word. this kind of stuff yes. goes on. It makes me sad because there's a certain sanctity to the scientific method and the discipline to me. And to have people pollute it with this kind of stuff makes me sad. Right. Uh, I think that's a great quote. Um, I just want to point out, you just can't fire a PhD student, all right? It's, you, you have to go through a whole academic procedure. And I know, because I've had some. So <laughs> he, may have, he may have said, you have to do this or you'll be fired. But in fact, it's not the case. You can't do that. Postdocs are a little easier to get rid yeah, of. Postdocs you can fire, yes. All right, Justin sent a link to the, an article about the first woman nominated to lead the National Academy of Sciences. Just a nice talking point to hopefully reduce the boys' clubness. And this is great. And I had uh, mentioned this to Joan Stites, and she said they went to the same high same school. School. It's pretty cool. Uh, this l this link is not only cool, but in the link is a um, a link to uh, what's her name, Marsha McNutt. Uh, a a link to her CV, mm -hmm. which is just fascinating. What a career! So she's a geophysicist, is that right? That's yes. correct. Yeah. And spent time as the director of the Monterey Aquarium. And yeah. prior to that was, I think, a professor at MIT yeah. and uh, had a lot to do with – she's been on like a dozen deep-sea diving expeditions. 
uh, to do uh, ocean geography. Uh, it's just a fascinating career, and I'm I'm really jazzed that she is taking up this position because I would imagine that her expertise is particularly relevant uh, in the uh, uh, currently because of um, the climate issues uh, that we yeah. face. She's not she's not a climate scientist, but her background is in an appropriate uh, area. It's of great. course, she's currently editor in chief of Science. Yes, she is. <laughs> Did you know the executive publisher of Science is Rush Holt? Well, no. in case some of you out there didn't know that, yeah, he is. I didn't know that. Did you know that, Alan? I did. Oh, interesting. All right. Rich Condit has a follow up. So, listening to the episode before last, um, uh, I think, or was it the last? I don't know. Before last. At any rate, we did the, uh, uh, you guys did the. You, you weren't there? Uh, I wasn't there. Oh, ah, okay. For the flu, narcolepsy thing. Yep. Um, and you know when I listen to these things, it really frustrates me because <laughs> I want to. I'm talking to the podcast the whole time. <laughs> um, so that is a uh, documented demonstra- demonstration of essentially a. Uh, uh, essentially an infection. It was an immunization, but uh, right. Right. essentially an infection inducing an, uh, a cross-reactive autoimmune response. Correct. Now, this has been a, a model for <clears throat> a theory about autoimmunity for a long time, that uh, uh, an, an encounter with <clears throat> some sort of um, immune stimulant, often a pathogen, uh, infection by a pathogen, creates this uh, cross-reactive response. And I was wondering whether this is the first actual demonstration of this happening in humans. I don't know the answer. The, okay, but I've seen are, mouse models mouse models with multiple sclerosis <laughs> and that kind of stuff, but I didn't know whether there were any other examples in humans. So in, in bacterial infections, there are. And I think the best known okay. one is you get streptococcal infections, you make antibodies to... Uh, heart, joint, brain. Ah, uh, that's right. right. Okay, it's, it's right. a well-known. As far there have been lots of suggestions about virus-triggered autoimmune diseases, and there are plenty of cross-reactive epitopes that you can find in various viruses, and that are also in, in self proteins. And you can show that if you make antibodies to those epitopes, they will cross-react with human tissue. But as far as I know, no one has really proven a viral autoimmunity. Uh, type of situation like we saw with the the flu vaccine yeah right. I think people this have, is people have worked <clears throat> people have worked on uh viral etiologies for for example type 1 diabetes yes. Yes. that's not yes. nailed down exactly i don't think it's i personally don't think it's nailed down no i think yeah there's a, there's a lot of uh, type 1 diabetes um is lupus i think was um mm-hmm. there so was something lupus is is certainly know making antibodies to SNRPs, right? Which right. Joan Stites, she actually discovered that, right? Yeah. Uh, but I don't think there's any virus trigger there. Okay. Um, but yeah, type 1 diabetes, very, uh, multiple sclerosis has also right. been suggested. Yes. Um, and there are others. But I don't think it's really been proven. Yeah, it's it's a lot of circumstantial evidence. Right. But the, yeah. the uh, this, I think, may be a really good, this flu narcolepsy. Yeah. Case yeah, is looks good. much more solid. So my my other follow up from the same episode was about Dixon's pick. Uh, he had a pick about the uh, relationship between algal blooms in the ocean and uh, cloud formation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I think it was peripherally mentioned, but those algal blooms are uh, uh, significantly influenced, basically controlled by virus infections. Right. Right. Um, and these are these uh, among the uh, viruses of the uh, the giant viruses. Uh, what are they called? Large nucleocytoplasmic DNA containing viruses. So it occurred to me as, as as this was going on is that this is a direct link between viruses and the weather. Which yes. is we <laughs> anticipated this by that's what, by years, five years, something like that. Yeah, that's why we talk about the weather. Yeah, exactly, because right. right. virology viruses influence the weather. Right. <clears throat> and my, we really ought to uh, do some of the papers that talk about those uh, 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 ocean algal blooms and the viruses that influence them sometimes because sure. it's fascinating stuff. We can stuff. do that. We can do whatever we want, Rich. Yeah, cool. We don't have any boss telling us what to do. Excellent. That is the cool thing here on TWIV. Yep. 
Maybe that's why I like it so much. <laughs> All right, I have a snippet. This this started from Sandra in Dallas, who wrote, Hundreds of rose bushes removed at the Fort Worth Botanical Garden, parentheses, which I think is one of the best places to see in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And it's a link to a news article in the Star-Telegram. Rose rosette is an epidemic, and North Texas is the epicenter. So, you know, roses coming down with this disease. Stems covered with thorns, leaves crinkled and puckered, deformed buds with and multiple shoots that turn a hue of red. So this, uh, not just mentioning this, this kind of piqued my interest. Uh, so I looked into it, and it's a really cool story. Do you want to hear about it? Yes. Absolutely. Rose rosette disease. Now, you need to learn a little bit about roses, all right, because they're the plants that are infected or afflicted by this disease. They were domesticated several thousand years ago, and, you know, they're kind of chugging along. People like them, but what really made the difference was um, the introduction of Chinese roses into Europe in the 18th century, and they interbred them with the existing roses, getting lots of colors, flower sizes, fragrance, and this. so they selected and bred and basically became the most popular ornamental plant in the world. Yearly estimated production, 18 billion cut stems, 60 to 80 million potted roses, and 220 million roses for landscaping. World value, tens of billions of dollars. Now, the reason you like a rose is because it looks good. So if a pathogen makes it look bad, this is not good for the people who sell roses. And there are many pathogens that cause rose diseases, including fungi, bacteria, viruses, nematodes, phytoplasmas, and these mainly affect the flower and the leaves. It's, that's not good for an ornamental plant, right? So right. people are very worried about this. So rose rosette disease is just one of many uh, diseases of, of roses. It causes proliferation of lateral shoots, which causes a witch's broom appearance. And I am sure you have seen roses with this, because I certainly have when I saw the pictures in, in these articles. They get lots of thorns, and these shoots that are coming out of the main stem, they get red, the flowers are distorted, they, they fall off, and eventually the, the plants die. So you can imagine that this is not good because no one wants to buy uh, roses that look like that. This disease was reported first in the 1940s, but not until the 80s was the etiologic agent observed. It's uh, really interesting because the, the, the phenotype for this disease, at least at, at some stages, is like a developmental yeah, problem. Yeah, exactly. Okay? The extra thorns in particular fascinate right. me. I mean, that's weird. Yeah, I don't, I'm don't. i sure we don't know how the virus does this because the virus has only recently been discovered. I didn't see any papers that look into that. But that's an interesting question, how the virus actually stimulates that. Yeah, it's like part of what it's doing is, is disturbing a developmental program. All right. So in the 80s, uh, virus particles were seen in diseased roses, um, and they were shown to be vectored by a mite, Philocoptes fructifilis. These are interesting uh, white or yellow carrot-shaped mites, and they are unusual because they only have two pairs of legs. Most adult mites have four. And I, I didn't know anything about mites, but apparently they're very host-specific. So yeah. these mites just like to eat roses or feed on roses. So And these are really, really tiny Yes. Yeah. Mites. Very tiny mites. So you, you need a dissecting microscope just to see, see them. them. Mm-hmm. So I found a, a paper from 2011 in the Journal of General Virology. The title is A Discovery 70 Years in the Making Characterization of Rose Rosette Virus. Now, I think the title is a little bit self-serving, don't you think? <laughs> 70 years in the making? Yes. Uh, that's a bit much. But basically what they did here, uh, they isolated RNA from affected plants. They cloned and sequenced it, and they found a negative strand RNA virus with four different RNAs. They called it Rose Rosette virus. And it's a new member of a existing gen- genus in the Bunyaviridae family. The genus is Emeravirus. And just to remind you, these are envelope negative strand viruses with multipartite genomes and other members include the hantaviruses, Bunyaviruses, which we've talked about, Rift Valley fever, Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever virus, Schmallenberg virus, which arose not too long ago in animals in Europe. So this is a new member of this genus. And did, was 
was it named because when they were first discovered, somebody say, hey, amorivirus? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, the plant guys are really uh, interesting with their name. They've got their right? own naming thing going on, yeah. So how do we know that the virus that they found causes disease? Well, they looked at 84 affected rose plants from all over the eastern half of the U.S., 1,300 kilometers apart, and they found the viral genome in all of them. They didn't find it in any of 30 symptomless plants. And they can also have a mite. They take a mite, they put it on an infected plant, and then take that mite and put it on an uninfected plant and transmit the disease. But unfortunately, they have not been able to isolate infectious virus. And there's no other plant that apparently can be infected. They've tried infecting other plants. They looked in fields where there are rose plants at the surrounding plants. They don't never find virus in them. So, you know, this is unfortunate because you would like to have the virus and put it in a plant and show that it causes the disease. And these guys in this paper speculate that it probably originated from wild roses. You know, this is a common practice to um, graft wild roses onto uh, domestic ones, and that can transfer the infection. Uh, these are treated but with miticides and pruning. So they said maybe we could make transgenic uh, roses with RNAi, and that might prevent infection. So that's pretty cool. And I'm sure we'll be seeing papers uh, about that. In and future. this thing, it spreads very, very readily because the mites get blown yeah. on the wind. Yeah. They just float off one plant and land on another and go lay their eggs. Um, so I guess it's a it's a vector borne airborne hmm. infection. Mites, that's an interesting picture. Mites blowing in the wind. Mites blowing in the wind. The answer, yeah. my friend, is blowing, blowing in, the, in wind. the wind. That could be a title. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, just a, te a technicality here. I'm looking at uh, viral zone. Yeah. And amorivirus, they have as an unassigned genus. Right. I think okay. it's probably so been proposed. With, yeah. it, it, I, I agree with you. It uh, kind of walks like a bunya virus and quacks like a bunya virus. But yeah. they apparently, because it's got four instead of three segments or something like that, yeah. uh, they've uh, got it. They've got it as a, a genus that is not assigned to a family, so it's out there floating by itself. My guess is that eventually they'll have some super family or something like that and include this in it, yeah. or make it a expand the definition of bunya viruses. Right. Yeah, I've, I get the sense that it, the ICTV is mulling over it because I, a couple of papers I looked at, they said it was a bunya virus, the Emmer okay. virus genus, you know, but it's probably right. not official. Yeah, and the, I think Viral Zone is, is pretty good about following ICTV, you know. In case you're wondering, there the Emmer viruses, the other ones, cause plant diseases with wonderful names. So I have to tell you, <laughs> European Mountain Ash Ring Spot Associated Virus. So you, can, you know everything about the virus from the yes. name. Fig mosaic virus. Raspberry leaf blotch virus. Pigeon pea sterility mosaic virus. <laughs> and the only one that's only partially informative is the high plains virus. Mm. Well, these are cool. The other ones, they'll tell you what the virus does, where it's from. It's yeah. Not, I, so I had fun looking at that. And plant viruses are always fun. So thank yeah. you, yep. Sandra, for pointing us in that direction, um, and, and even learned a little bit about mites. Now, our paper for today was actually sent by, I don't know, this guy, Rich Condit. Do you, does any of you know who that is? Wait a minute. Did I send you that? You did. At ASV, actually. <laughs> you sent I'll a, be darned. You sent it. Where'd you find okay. it? You're just looking around, and you found I, it. I, it, I, it. I don't know. Is I he still a virologist, <laughs> didn't he? <laughs> oh yeah, he's always a virologist. He's. Uh, I probably forwarded it from somebody else who sent it to me. Okay, well, it's a cool article. It is. I don't it, find things; I just pass them on. It is a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine. It's a brief report called "A Variegated Squirrel Bornavirus Associated with Fatal Human Encephalitis," and uh, this is amazing that it's a brief report because it's got a lot of data in it. It does. It's a huge amount of data. So basically, this story is about uh, three older men from Saxony-Anhalt in Germany who all developed fatal encephalitis in uh, 2011, and they all and died. The, the authors, by the way, uh, Bernd Hoffman uh, is first author, and Martin Beer is the senior author. Thank you. A lot of MDs and have, DV, DVMs on it. Yeah. Right. 
These guys died two to four months after onset of clinical symptoms, and those symptoms included fever, shivers, psychomotor slowing, confusion, unsteady gait, uh, myoclonus, which is jerky muscle contractions, paralysis of eye muscles, and coma. And these. And they also had bilateral crural vein thrombosis. Oh, yes. Those are leg veins. Yeah. Uh, and they had clots in these veins, and they they can't figure. All three of them had right. that as a symptom, but they can't figure out what Why? the relationship yeah. is between that and anything else. And they all had other medical conditions like hypertension, diabetes, and uh, obesity. And this happened over a period of, maybe you already said this, three years. The first was 2011, and the last was like 2014, 2013. That's right. Uh, Brain imaging of these individuals revealed lesions that are consistent with a viral infection, encephalitis. But they could not isolate any infectious agent by microscopic cell culture, molecular, or serologic testing of cerebrospinal fluid, biopsy samples, or serum. And if, and if you look at the supplementary uh, data, they were extraordinarily comprehensive oh, it's yes. and looking for yes. pathogens. I was, I was just going to say, t- table S2, so they do serology. They take serum and look for various bacteria, fungi, viruses. And this is actually very informative of all three patients. Uh, they look, they were, at least one was positive for rubella virus, measles virus, Mumps, herpes simplex, varicella zoster, cytomegalovirus, Epstein-Barr, human herpes viruses 6 and 7. And I, they only found IgG, which means that it's not a new infection. right? You would, otherwise, mm-hmm. you would see IgM. So they ruled out these viruses. These, these are things that they've had before. And these are viruses that almost everyone gets, of course. Now, the reason that they would do that sort of a workup on these patients, um, I think, yeah, you know, is it okay? Yeah, people show up at the ER and they have some neurological problem that's never properly diagnosed, and they die, and they don't end up in a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine. But there was one rather telling fact about these three, which mm. is that they all knew each other. That's right. They right hung out sure. and they all had the same hobby. That's right. Which strongly suggested that there was something that they'd all gotten into that that yeah. Got him. I just want to mention a few more. You can tell us that hobby in a moment, Alan, yep. but let me just mention they were negative for Coxsackie, Dengue, West Nile, tick-borne encephalitis, rabies, hantaviruses, <laughs> LCM, Synbis. Negative for, they looked at very various bacteria, syphilis, Leptospira, Borrelia, negative, negative. They looked for fungi. They looked for parasites. Only one guy was positive for toxoplasma, which and the other two weren't done, actually. I would have bet they were all positive for toxoplasma antibodies. Cerebral spinal fluid, again, negative for antibodies against any of these. Uh, and then they did PCR, again, for CSF, for various viruses. They didn't find anything, various fungi, parasites. And then the table goes to brain biopsy. And there, well... Then, then they're dead, I guess. Well, the biopsy may have been when they were alive, but they have brain autopsy. So here at this point, they all died, and they took biopsy. And they still didn't find anything against these known viruses. All right. So all this stuff is negative. And as Alan, what did they have in common? What did they do? They all liked to breed squirrels, which is a thing, apparently. It is? Yes. <laughs> Maybe in this part of the world, or you're saying everywhere. There's if you if you look this up, we've talked a little bit about the exotic animal trade before, um, and there's there is uh, some segment of the population that um, is into keeping things like squirrels as pets, Mm. and uh, these guys were all three avid breeders of squirrels. Um, They hung out. They they knew each other, they exchanged squirrel breeding pairs to improve each other's breeding <laughs> programs with their squirrels. Um, and, of course, you know, they're handling these animals and they've been scratched and bitten by them at various times, and so suspicion turns to the squirrels, which is, pre- again, presumably why they're testing for so many infectious diseases and things like hantavirus. Yeah. Uh, um, they're thinking, these guys picked something up from their rodents. And they're not just the, any uh, squirrels, the, right? They're variegated. They are variegated, variegated squirrels. S. variegatoides, which is a, um, it, it's not native to Germany. Uh, it is a Latin American squirrel. 
Mm. Uh, so these are these are in Costa Rica and Guatemala, and they're um, they're they're cute. I mean, they're squirrels. Mm. They're called variegated squirrels because they have a different color yeah. pattern to them. And um, I'm guessing that probably some of the breeding was aimed at generating particular color patterns, if it's anything like other animal breeding programs. Um, so they are cute. They, had, they are. <clears throat> they were able to identify a squirrel that had had contact with patient number three. And they right. looked in that animal. They didn't find any pathogens. So they stood, they did deep sequencing. And this then showed viral sequences in liver, lung, kidney, chest cavity fluid, and oropharyngeal swab material. And these sequences were related to mammalian boronaviruses. So they call so, this new virus variegated squirrel one boronavirus, VSBV1. So now they. So have, this is a member of mononegavirales. Right. Okay, so it's a negative, single-stranded, negative sense uh, RNA genome. Uh, and, uh, it's a, uh, a membraned virus. Mononegavirales includes uh, what? Measles, mumps, and rubella, mumps, rhabdoviruses. Uh, yeah. Right, uh, including rabies. And I was curious as to what uh, distinguished boronaviruses from other mononegavirales, because just looking at the viral zone uh, genome and that kind of stuff, it looked pretty much the same. So I wrote Sean Whalen, and uh, he says, in contrast to other animal infecting mononegavirales, born a disease virus replicates in the nucleus. Its L protein, hmm. that's the polymerase, is much shorter. Uh, around 1,700 L is a the polymerase of most of these is really huge. 1,700 amino acids as opposed to 2,100. It still contains the um, uh, RNA polymerase connector and capping domains, but the methyl transferase and C-terminal domains are different. That's just a, a detail. Mm -hmm. He says they try to express, and uh, Sean is into L protein. Right. Uh, they tried to express and purify uh, the borne disease virus L protein and weren't successful. He hopes he well, can change I, that. In I'm future. not surprised. You can't express proteins. Ah, okay. So he, we'll have he, to tell him that. Yeah, if he Sean, if he tries to produce them, he'll probably be successful. Okay. Yes. We'll tell him that. Maybe <laughs> taking the wrong approach. Okay. At any rate, so these guys replicate in the nucleus, that's and that's cool. what yeah. is a big distinction between them and other mononegaviralis. Wonder what they're using in the nucleus. Do you know? Why are they doing that? I mean, in the case of flu, it uh, snatches caps and does some splicing and stuff. I don't know in the ca in this case what they're doing there. Yeah, I don't, offhand, I don't know the nuclear requirement, but um, okay. I'm sure it's known. Actually, if you look at the um, uh, if you look at the uh, viral zone diagram of the genome, uh, there of the last three genes, M and G and L. There's a significant amount of alternate splicing going on to give appropriate expression. Uh, did I say that right? <laughs> of those genes, so they are using the splicing apparatus in the nucleus. So, and since you mentioned that, um, we have talked before about boronavirus sequences integrated into uh, cellular genomes. Yes, both humans and squirrel have these. We talked about a paper where in the, in the Striped squirrel, the 13 striped squirrel, I think, or right. maybe it was 17. I don't remember how many stripes. These integrated sequences actually produce a viral protein that protects the cells from infection. So it's pretty cool. So now they had these sequences. They said, oh, it's a, it's a new born virus. They could go back. They deep sequenced RNA from a squirrel brain and also from patient three. They got complete viral genomes, nearly identical between the squirrel and the patient. So strongly suggesting that one came from the other. And, and this is a novel boronavirus. It forms, a, when you do phylogenetic analysis of the sequence, it makes a distinct lineage within the boronavirus phylogeny. And it looks like it arose from, a, so in, among the boronaviruses, there are mammalian boronaviruses and avian boronaviruses. So this one looks more, more closely related to the mammalian boronaviruses. They could also find uh, viral antigens in brain tissue from the squirrel and the patient one using uh, antibodies against various viral proteins. They also found antibodies against this virus in serum and CSF of one of the patients. So you have a number of 
evidence is suggesting that the VSBV1 is the agent. The similarity in viral sequences between the squirrel and the patient, finding our viral RNA in all three patient brains. I don't know if I mentioned that, but they did find it. Uh, immunostaining in the in the human brain, anti bornavirus antibodies in the CSF, and then of course the epidemiologic link among all three patients in their pet squirrels. And importantly, they don't find it anywhere they shouldn't. Right. No contamination, mm-hmm. right? So they don't find it they in in brains of people who died of other things, um, including other vi- with other viral diseases like HIV encephalopathy um, or HSV encephalitis. So they're looking at other good places to find something like this, yeah. uh, and it's not there. And um, when they leave out the, the reverse transcriptase, they don't get a PCR product. Right. So it's got, it's got some good controls in yep. there. Yep. So this is different from Borna disease virus. That is actually the first virus of this uh, genus discovered, and that virus mainly infects horses and sheep. It does infect the CNS, and it's very it's right. highly fatal. Originally described in the 1700s in Europe as a disease of farm horses, and I have to tell you that uh, in Germany they call one of the names for this disease was Hitziga Kaffkrankheit, which means hot-headed disease. And then later it was called Borna after a major outbreak in that town in Saxony. It happens to be Saxony where these infected That's interesting. squirrels, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, these squirrels are from a completely different part of the world, and now in Saxony that you've got these yeah. guys showing up um, at the hospital with another Bornavirus. Birds also have Bornavirus, uh, which was recently discovered, and and... Rich Condit, I don't know if you were at ASV in Minneapolis, but I was. Don Gannam told this story about they, this disease called fatal proventricular dilation disease of citizens. Turns out to be caused by a bornavirus, and he and, and another lab discovered that. So same, same, same. These viruses, uh, in every case, I believe, where they've been uh, studied, are causing uh, CNS disease. That's right. 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 That's right. So I presume these patients, you know, acquired the disease by being bitten by the squirrels because the squirrels have the virus in their uh, saliva, their oropharyngeal swabs, right? A lot of virus there. And why, you know, why these people? Maybe because they had pre-existing medical conditions. Who knows? But uh, yeah, they they did all have pre-existing medical mm-hmm. conditions, and they were all. Uh, old guys, right? Over 60. Right. Yep. That's an old guy, Vincent. Okay, I got it. It's no problem. <laughs> I, I can live with that. It's fine. I had my whole life so far, you know. I've, that's right. I've gone, we well, go through to, it, and that's it. That's right. <laughs> I got you it. You have to live with that. Um, now, I just want to say one thing about Borna disease virus, this disease of sheep and horses. For a while, it was thought that it might cause human psychiatric disorders. Right. All right. In fact, the virus was actually first cloned by Ian Lipkin. This is his first virus discovery. And he spent many years hunting down and ideas that it was causing a, a whole variety of psychiatric disorders and even chronic fatigue syndrome and multiple sclerosis. There are lots of reports in the literature. None of them confirmed. And finally, they did a, a, a blinded multicenter analysis, no evidence for human infection. So there doesn't seem to be any human infection that we can detect with Borna disease virus. It's kind of like uh, the XMRV story in a way, yes. if you look at it. So again, that's a very different virus from this squirrel virus, but just in case you want to know Borna disease history. Uh, so I guess the lesson here is that be careful with your exotic rodents, right? Don't breed squirrels. I mean, a lot of people buy. Out of that, uh, a lot of people buy these. I mean, do you think that they they should be screened for the virus? Uh, I, I try not to pass strong judgments on other people's hobbies, but I, I don't. This idea of um, breeding exotic animals, um, you know, that that were not previously dem- domesticated generations ago, I, I I'm not real comfortable with that. It seems like it's a setup for this sort of thing. And maybe this sort of thing happened when people were domesticating dogs or sheep or cattle. Um, but that's all been done for us. And so yeah, now we have yeah. those as domestic animals. Um, so to go out and import a squirrel from Central America and and try to breed it as a pet, 
um, it just seems like you're you're walking into something like this, and and it's tragic that the you know you got these these three guys are dead because yeah, of this died. probably. Generally, if you were if you decided you were going to screen for stuff, you wouldn't know what to screen for. Before right. this paper, you couldn't have screened for this virus, right, right. and God knows how many other pathogens are out there uh, that we don't know about that could do similar sorts of things. So I, I don't think screening is really a viable option unless you're going to deep sequence everything or something like that, which I don't think is That's a viable, viable option either. But I mean, Rich, the people buy wild rats and they get these pox virus infections. Right? Absolutely, yeah. No. So that's what happens. So, so it, one thing one thing that wasn't clear to me is now this happened over a period of uh, two or three years. They they looked at one squirrel as the as a culprit in at least one of these diseases. Mm. Um, I don't know if there was more than one squirrel implicated, and it, it um, I it wasn't clear to me whether this squirrel had some sort of long-term or persistent infection because the normal pathology of the disease as I uh, as I understood it is that uh, over a relatively well relatively months maybe short period of time certainly not years you wind up dying of uh, CNS disease but this we're talking about a uh, uh, a, an event that transpired over several years, and I don't know if it involved just one or multiple squirrels. So it wasn't clear to me whether a squirrel is harboring this over an extended period of time or not. And to me, that's an interesting question. Yeah, I, I, I could you also, figure that out for the paper? I could not. I also wondered yeah. if the squirrels were affected at all by right. the virus, and how many of the squirrels were infected. I don't think we know that. It's a good question. I presume they. They capture squirrels and then they breed them, right? Right. So, yeah. where I mean, are they passing on the virus, you know, in the colony, or where is it coming from? Could you get rid of it? Yeah, it's a, I think there are a lot of uh, unanswered questions here. And I think, that's it, an, I think it would be very interesting to go to the native populations of these squirrels and just do sure, sure. Uh, do a screening and see how prevalent this is, or if it's in them at all. I agree. And that's yeah. an important question because the the lots of times these zoonoses, the way they uh, you know, characteristically present is there's some animal that has established an equilibrium right. with this virus, and so uh, a, a large number of them are infected, and they're infected over a long period of time and asymptomatically. And when the uh, when the spillover happens uh, into a host that's not adapted to this virus, that's when you see disease. And so under those situations where you're not dealing necessarily with an acute infection in the an animal, uh, the danger of a spillover, it seems to me, is greater because the animal's not obviously diseased and they can carry the virus for a long period of time. So right. you may interact with the animal figuring everything's going to be okay, and it's not. So obviously this is this is a potentially dangerous virus, right? So it killed these three individuals. I think it would be interesting also to know if it's in any other animals in the wild, right? right? Just mm -hmm. so you give people a heads up, you should stay away from from these animals, right? And and with a the usual caveat about the limitations of seroprevalence studies, it would be interesting to um, see yeah. if the population of squirrel breeders has antibodies against yeah. this. You know, maybe these yeah. guys just because they were um, over the age of sixty, I won't say elderly. Um, and uh, what are, you, are you forty-five or something? Yeah. Uh, somewhere in there, yeah. You're not fifty uh, yet. No, no, I'm not quite fifty yet. Wow. Um, I smell a I smell a party. <laughs> It'll be a few years yet. Yeah, and for, of course, as part of that study, you want to have non-squirrel breeders as exactly. your controls. It'll be interesting to see if there's any seropositivity in the general population as right. well. Right. Yeah, because now we have reagents, of course. All right, thank you for delivering that paper, Rich. Very interesting. I had a look. Uh, you know, somebody sent me that, I'm sure. It's cool. Uh, it's uh, cool. I'll look it up. Okay. All right, let's do some email. Uh, Al oh, wait. First, before we do email, I have to tell you that this episode is also sponsored by ASM Gap. If you'd like to turn your science into a company, the ASM is running a workshop that'll teach you how to do that. It's going to be from the 1st to the 3rd of October. The application deadline is August 20th, and you can learn more at asmgap.org slash TSC. Basically, at this meeting, they will have successful entrepreneurs 
who will tell their stories about how they turned their science into a company uh, and give you tips, advice, and resources on doing the same thing for yours. So if you had had a result or a reagent you wanted to commercialize it, maybe you should go to this meeting, asmgap.org slash TSC. All right, Alan, can you take John's email? Sure. It's a pleasant 19C west of Boston this morning, and I only passed on my viruses to one mosquito so far today. <laughs> Good. In TWIV 338, you discussed common names of insect orders in which the antiviral Hig gene is found. The discussion of whether Coleoptera refers to beetles or beach balls obscured the common property of the insect orders mentioned. They all belong to hollow metabola, insects with complete metamorphosis. Excellent point. Figure one of the paper incorrectly excludes butterflies from this group under the alternative name Enderoterogota. Mm. A major omission from, omission from the paper is analysis of non holometabolous insects. The authors say that non-insect arthropods lack the, the Hig gene, but say nothing about aphids, bugs, cock cockroaches, dragonflies, etc. There is a 100 million year gap between the first insect, early Devonian, and the last common ancestor of the order studied, late Carboniferous. The book Evolution of the Insects offers a good survey of what is known about, surprise, evolution of the insects. <laughs> and it gives a link to that. <laughs> A very good point. Yeah. Uh, yeah, a good point. I think the authors should be made aware of this. Unfortunately, yes. they probably do not listen to Twitter. Uh, John, yeah, it might, might. Be, might be good to send a technical comment. Yeah, it's a yeah. plus paper. Well, I think you can put a comment there, right? Oh, yeah, you could website. probably comment online. Yeah, why don't you do that? It's a very good comment, John. Yes. John knows his bugs. He does. Yes. I wonder what John does for a living. And I think we're going to find out. Yeah. Let us know, John. What do you do for a living? All right, uh, Rich, can you take the next one, please? Len writes, Ty, Vince, and other Twivers. I listened with interest to the prion discussion in Twiv 343. I remember someone saying that cross-species transfer between deer and humans was unlikely, but I was wondering if that applied to people who eat venison, deer meat, on a regular basis. There are people who hunt deer and store meat for later use, and I'm wondering what the chances are that they will get prion disease. Currently, it's 94 degrees Fahrenheit and partly cloudy in Coral Springs, Florida. Thanks, Len. Uh, so we discussed this before, and uh, I uh, kind of did a, a PubMed search and uh, came up with uh, one paper that I chose for its recent date from April 2015 called Human Prion Protein Sequence Elements Impede Cross-Species Chronic Wasting Disease Transmission. And here they describe what we've described before, which is an animal model for looking at uh, cross-species transmission of prions. And the deal is that you can, uh, in order to study cross-species transmission, now taking into account this is an animal model and we know that mice do lie, yes. as monkeys exaggerate, nevertheless. Um, if you make a transgenic mouse that expresses the human prion protein and infect that mouse with the human prion, that mouse will get uh, prion disease and, and die. If you make a transgenic mouse that expresses the elk, for example, deer or prion protein, um, and in fact, that animal with the elk or deer prion, that animal will get sick and die. If you infect the mouse expressing the human prion uh, gene with the elk prion protein, they're resistant. And conversely, if you express uh, infect the mouse, the transgenic mouse ex uh, that produces, sorry, the uh, elk or deer prion protein with the elk or deer prion, I'm saying with the human prion, uh, that mouse is resistant. So that's the model to, uh, stro to suggest that there is no cross-species transmission. And by the way, there are other uh, 
situations where there's epidemiologic evidence there there can be cross species transmission for example bovine spongiform encephalitis where the animal model uh, mimics the epidemiologic data and supports the notion of cross species transmission and in addition there's been a fair amount of epidemiology done on the uh, deer and elk uh, the the wasting disease uh, that argues that uh, there is uh, no infection of humans uh, with uh, the wasting disease prion. They're, they're very circumspect about that. They, they don't even say that the epidemiologic data doesn't support it. They say it's inconclusive or something like that. But basically, they've looked at, they've done studies where they've looked at like uh, 17,000 individuals, 20% of whom uh, in uh, consume uh, venison or uh, other uh, deer or elk uh, meat products and are hunters or whatever and uh, apparently there's no evidence from those that there is uh, transmission of the wasting disease to the humans. Yeah, <clears throat> That's what I understand as the status of that problem. Yeah, that's correct. I think, you know, there's no evidence so far. A lot of people eat venison. They do say yeah. stay away from the spinal cord and brain especially when you're field dressing. But um, it could, of course, go through cows. If cows get contaminated in the um, pastures and we eat the cows, then we could get it indirectly that way. But I think, The interesting uh, thing is that there's like only four amino acid dif- or they identified in this same work, I think, four amino acid differences between the uh, uh, cervid prion and the human prion, which if they change can now uh, confer susceptibility. So they think that they have narrowed down the regions in the prion that uh, account for the uh, species specificity, which is yeah. really interesting. Yeah, it is so cool. they had to do a gain-of-function yeah. study to do that. They absolutely did. Exa- yeah, they did. They can be extremely informative. Yes. Now, yeah, I wouldn't be too concerned about eating venison, but I would, I would certainly avoid um, any, any kind of unnecessary contact with the brain or spinal cord of um, really any kind of wild animal. You know, uh, a little aside here. The other day, we have we have two dogs, and the other day, one of them was throwing up. And my wife said the dog's throwing up because she ate deer poop in our backyard. Ugh. And, and she said, so I'm going to give her some anti-parasite uh, drug, okay? And I'm thinking... I'm more worried about the prions in the deer poop <laughs> because they do excrete them in urine and feces. So, I don't know, maybe in about, I guess the incubation period is too long for the dog, right? Yeah. Dogs live 15 years. I don't know. I'm worried that it'll start getting Not weird. Too long for you. If it starts yeah. getting weird, I'll suspect a prion disease. <laughs> so, your dog isn't weird to start with? <laughs> no. It eats deer poop for starters. Uh, dogs don't, you always eat I poop, know, don't dogs. They? <laughs> Yeah. They're weird about that. That's, Coprophagus. Wow. Uh, next one's from Theodore. Dear Twiv faculty, recent episodes of Twiv have included mention of cherry trees. I love this letter. This is great. I mean, this is so this is so cool. Our <laughs> listeners are so wonderful. This is delightful. <laughs> Specifically those in Washington, D.C.'s Tidal Basin. And in, listeners may be interested in the backstory of their donation, which involves Jokichi Takamine, a Japanese scientist, industrialist, and philanthropist who holds two of the earliest U.S. patents in biotechnology. So he lived from 1854 to 1922. He has a patent in 1894 process of making diastatic enzyme for asp- from Aspergillus oryzae and 1903 five separate patents for purification of the hormone adrenaline. The former was the first U.S. patent of a microbial enzyme, while the latter was the first U.S. patent of a purified hormone. Born to a physician father, he demonstrated academic prowess as a youth and commenced the study of medicine at age 16, although chemistry soon became a passion. Two years later, changed field and schools and became a chemical engineer. After graduate chemical studies abroad, he returned to Japan and worked for the Japanese government as head of chemistry for the Imperial Department of Agriculture and Commerce. He later met his future American wife in New Orleans, Left government employment, started his own factory and research lab in Japan. Several years after his birth of his two sons, his family moved to the U.S., settling in New York. His initial ventures in the brewing industry in the U.S. were unsuccessful. However, he sold the rights to his amylase enzyme, takadiastase, which I have used, 
to Park Davis and Company, which promoted it as a digestive enzyme. It is still available today, and it became wealthy. What have you used that enzyme? For? Somewhere in the lab, because I know tachydiastase. I have bought this at some point. I don't know why or when, but it's it rings a bell probably a long time ago. Probably, probably to get some amylase binding protein off of a column or something could like be. that. It could be. <laughs> Takamine's next success was isolation and pure patenting adrenaline after a court battle in which no less a jurist than Judge Learned Hand ruled in his favor. He secured his first patent. And adrenaline, of course, gold standard and most popular worldwide vasopressor added to local anesthetics. He founded three major companies, Takamine Lab in Clifton, a lab in New York City and Tokyo. The New Jersey plant produced, among other things, Salversan, <clears throat> arsphenamide, Dr. Paul Ehrlich, which was the first man-made chemotherapeutic agent, and a budding scientist, Selman Waxman, was employed there to oversee toxicity testing. Oh, my gosh. Overly, the Tokyo Enterprise survives as Sankyo Pharmaceuticals, one of Japan's <laughs> largest. <laughs> we know that company. Yeah. In 1909, the Committee of Japanese Residents of New York, in a goodwill gesture to celebrate the Hudson Fulton Centennial, donated 2,000 cherry trees funded by Takamine to beautify Sakura, formerly Claremont Park, in Upper Morningside Heights, not far from Columbia University. The original shipment was lost at sea. <laughs> Replacement trees arrived. I shouldn't laugh. That's not nice. Arrived in 1912. So one of the reasons we got this letter is because we had this conversation about cherry trees where you said you didn't care about the cherry yes. trees. And I was entertained to find that the first shipment was planted near Columbia University. It's pretty funny. So yeah. uh, have, are you familiar with these trees? Are they still there? Yeah, they're there. I don't go to see okay. them because Morningside Park is pretty dangerous. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. During a 1909 visit to Washington, Takamine became aware that President Taft's wife wished to beautify the tidal basin with cherry trees, so he donated 2,000 trees from the city of Tokyo. All but 12 were burned due to disease and infestation by insect and nematodes after inspection by the Department of Agriculture. On their arrival in D.C., a subsequent replacement shipment of 3,020 trees arrived and were planted in 1912. So if you're Takamine, you should always just place two orders for cherry trees. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Throughout his life, Takamine worked tirelessly to foster relations between the U.S. and Japan, was the founder of the Japanese Society to Foster Japanese-American Relations and the Nippon Club, which is one of New York City's oldest cultural organizations. For this, he was the Japanese emperor awarded him the Order of the Sun Fourth Class. I didn't know there were different classes. Which class is yours, Alan? Uh, I, gosh, I'd have to dig it up. It's been so long. Sadly, he, although he was married to an American woman for almost 35 years, lived in the USA most of his life, was a prominent, wealthy, and philanthropic individual. The prejudices against Asians during his long sojourn in our country prevented his acquiring U.S. citizenship. That really sucks. It's too bad. Yes. He was uh, 68 years old at the time of his death, and in an altruistic move, his will stated that his body be donated to a New York hospital for dissection or cremated. According to the Times' full-column obituary, which is behind a paywall, <laughs> Dr. Takamine's will was disregarded. The physicians of the hospital, out of respect, who was perhaps the best-known Japanese in this country, refused the donation as they saw no value in dissecting. Cremation was denied by the church he had converted to. So his wife arranged for his funeral to be held at St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York, and he's interred in an impressive vault at Woodside Cemetery, which I think is in Queens, right? For much more detail on his rather remarkable life, see the timeline, Adrenaline and Cherry Trees by Joan <laughs> Bennett, professor of cell and molecular biology, Tulane University, then president of Society for Industrial Microbiology. I know Joan Bennett, and ASM president, yeah. And there's a website dedicated to him, jokichitakamine.com. Maintained by Takabayo. In closing, to coin a phrase, don't lose sight of the forest because of the cherry trees. <laughs> okay. I, I, it's, I understand. Well, I, I don't really want to go see them. I'm going to go see them, man. I'll and go I'm see I'm going to take pictures. <laughs> I'm going to send them you a thousand pictures. Why don't we do a twiv in front of the cherry trees? Yes. That's a Please. good idea. <laughs> As an avid loyal listener to both twiv and twim, I thank all your contributors for their erudition and dedication in bringing the exciting, ever-expanding world of scientific knowledge to your listeners. And this is from Ted Splaver, who is a DMD and is on the faculty of uh, 
the College of Dental Medicine, Nova Southeastern University, which is in South Fort Lauderdale, and he is in the Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery. And, and clearly has a strong avocation for Dakamini or the cherry trees or something. Or history in general. Yeah. yeah this is great. Yeah, I, I don't know why he's he's liking Twiv and Twim, but I guess, you know, if you're working in the mouth, he would be interested in microbes. Sure. Right? All right, let's do one more, okay? Uh, All right. Or let's say two more because they're, sh- they're short. Yeah, yeah. Alan, take one. Sharon writes, hello, fellow scientists. I'm listening to your banter about commercial antibodies, and believe me, I feel exactly the same. Something that might be helpful and I think is a good idea is making use of Benchwise.org, a Stanford-based website in which people review antibodies and other reagents. If we spread the word, the TWIV bump, hopefully everyone will start using it to expand the repertoire of reviews. And this, I've heard of this. Um, oh, now it's not loading. Yeah, yeah I've been there. Oh, there we yeah, go. That's a good site. Um, yeah, so it's it's a sort of a, um, I don't know, it's like Yelp or um, one of these restaurant review sites, except it's for, <laughs> um, it's for antibodies. Right. And you can go and you pick out your, you know, whatever you're thinking of buying an antibody to, and you can review, you can look at different companies' products and different preps of it. And, um, you know, you might not want to get the one that's got the two-star review and people say it doesn't work and the... Than others, uh, others they do. Mm. So I that, think that's that, that's an excellent, excellent idea. Yeah, we'll spread. Yeah, the word. if we spread the word on that, maybe that'll cause uh, do some good. Yeah, and Sharon notes uh, notes she's not affiliated with Benchwise. So, all right, and take the last one, Rich. Bill writes an interesting explanation of CRISPR. Uh, in an easily readable format with copious links, and he gives a uh, link to a uh, blog. Uh, I'm loading it here again. I had a look at this uh, last night. Uh, this guy is a software engineer, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Um, uh, what's his name? Andrew. Uh, Andrew Gibianski. And easy. he blogs on a wide variety of topics, yeah. and he's got a fairly extensive blog here on how CRISPR technology works that actually starts out with a uh, primer on uh, molecular biology, uh, DNA and transcription and translation, and describes the uh, discovery of CRISPR and uh, how it works and what its applications are. Mm -hmm. I didn't read it in detail, but what I read seemed uh, quite clear and very well informed. So I thought it's quite good. And he has a list of references that he used at the end, and some of them are the primary literature. And one thing I like more than anything else is he says at the end, found a mistake. Please be aware I'm not an expert in this field. If you find mistakes or important omissions, let me know. Right. So he's got the right idea. Excellent. All right. <clears throat> Let's do some picks of the week. Alan, what do you have? Oh, what did I put in here? Oh, yes. Um, just scrolling down to it so I can get the link here. Um, so next month, August, is National Immunization Awareness Month, in case you weren't aware. Um, and this is a, uh, what I've linked to for my pick is a campaign that the CDC and a bunch of other groups that are involved with promoting immunization <clears throat> have decided to do to to promote this concept. Um, and it's this, they're using this marketing tool called Thunderclap. So you can sign up here, and if you enable this app to do its thing, then on um, the, the designated date and time, it will post a tweet into your timeline or a Facebook post or Tumblr post, if you use those, um, which will... Um, a uh, link to the CDC's information page on immunization, and it's got a tweet explaining um, what's going on here, and and that vaccination is the best way to uh, to stop yeah. serious diseases. All right, good. So I went ahead and signed up with it, and I thought I'd maybe go ahead and give them the twiv bump. They're trying to get a hundred people signed up to do this. They've got eighty-one so far. I'm sure they will not mind if they exceed a hundred. So yeah, I'm we'll do get this. Them. Go for we'll, it. We'll get them. Uh... I'm signing up right now. We'll get them over 100. And I I will tweet it to my 8,150 followers. Okay. Cool. And they should get it by that, right? 
Yes. Unless all of them don't do anything. They're just right. stalkers, right? <laughs> Rich, what do you have? Uh, so I have spent the last week in glorious reverie <laughs> with my seven grandchildren. <laughs> and that includes bedtime stories. <laughs> and one bedtime story that uh, really impressed me was a book by Andrea Beatty, illustrated by David Roberts, called Rosie Revere Engineer. And it's about a young girl who aspires to be an engineer and uh, her, her trials and tribulations, her failures and successes. And it's just a wonderful story that, uh, among, among other things, highlights that uh, – you know, in order to succeed, you have to be able to tolerate a significant amount of failure. One of the quotes from this that I really liked uh, is as she's uh, getting an idea to do something for her great great aunt, who is Rosie the Riveter. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, she's getting this idea of what to do, and she says, But questions are tricky. And some hold on tight, and this one kept Rosie awake through the night. <laughs> so, <laughs> the author understands uh, uh, what it is like to be bugged by uh, a scientific question. It's terrific. And in fact, the same author has another book called uh, Iggy the Architect, uh, which is equally good, but I wanted to focus my pick on this because it's particularly good. So, there you mm -hmm. go. Nice. Seven grandkids. Seven grandkids. Get, are they going to have more? Is that it? Uh, they claim that that's it. <laughs> and, and and I believe them. I think they're done. So what's the three, three, one? Uh, three, two, so, two? Uh, my daughters each have two, okay. a, a girl and a boy, and my son has three, three boys. Nice. Well, and the total clan ranges in age from... Uh, what, eight months to seven years. Nice. Well, I got your picture. It's a lovely family. Just gorgeous. It, it except, is. Uh, except you. <laughs> well, I am blessed. I sent you two pictures there, one of everybody together and the other of just uh, uh, my wife and I and the three kids. We, had a, we actually took cool. advantage of the uh, occasion to get a professional photographer out nice. who has worked for my son before, does really great work, and spent, you know, just did everybody. It was wonderful. Oh, nice. Nice. Very nice, Rich. I'm getting goosebumps. Yep. Ah, goosebumps. That's a it's an arc. It's <laughs> <laughs> goosebumps are now an arc. That's great. Uh, I yeah, have a great. I have an article from nine to five Mac, which uh, references a study done by another uh, party whose name is escaping me. But anyway, the conclusion is that 82% of mobile podcast listening happens on the iPhone, mostly using Apple's Podcasts app. So that's interesting because we do a podcast. We do several, actually. We like to know how people are listening. And I'm not sure it's right because I've heard other podcasters saying that their audience is skewed in different directions and so forth. So just thought it was an interesting study. And also... Um, that uh, well, I'm wondering what our listeners do. I'm going to put up a poll um, set, which asks whether you listen to Twiv, Twip, and Twim on an Android device or an iPhone. I'm just curious if our numbers are different uh, from that. Um, so I think um, if this is correct, it means that we can get a lot of listeners on Android devices who aren't listening. I think part of the problem is that the iPhone has with it a podcast app that comes, you know, loaded on the phone. And people, a lot of people probably just use that. And in fact, 78% of the people who use um, uh, the iPhone for listening to podcasts use the native app that comes with the phone. And of course, there is no such thing for Android because Android is found on many, many devices made by different companies. So there's no one podcast app. So, um, Maybe uh, that, that's probably not going to happen, but I hear that Apple may make a um, an app for Android devices, which may help that as well. Anyway, I'll put up a poll and you tell us um, what you do. I've also put a button on the twiv.tv page, and supposedly if you have an Android device and you click it, it will bring you to, if you have an Android device and a player that will play podcasts it will allow you to subscribe to our podcast that way supposedly easier 
Okay. We have two listener picks. Uh, Sandra sends a link to a uh, an image or a graphic showing the economic impact of recent zoonotic disease outbreaks. This was on World Zoonoses Day. <laughs> when was this? Um, July 6th, World Zoonoses Day. You know, they got all the big ones there. Uh, rabies, SARS, H1N1, H5N1. So that's a cool graphic. So thank you for that. And we also have a uh, pick from Peter who writes, I thought this would make an interesting listener pick. Mam- Mammal carnivorous plant mutualism. A pitcher plant species in Borneo attracts bats by reflecting sonar signals from them, advertising a cozy roost, and getting nitrogen-rich guano in return. And then there's, a, there's another pitcher plant that acts as toilets for tree shrews. <laughs> <laughs> They're the dogs of the plant world. This is amazing. This is, this this is stuff- amazing. So the plants get nutrient-rich poo. <laughs> and they're uh, and they're giving off nectar for the tree shoes, t- tree shrews to attract them at the same time. Incredible! Look at this picture of the shrew. Using the shrew sitting potty. on top. That's of That's so the funny. That's just great. I love it. <laughs> Biology is amazing, isn't it? Yeah, it is amazing. And that is Twib three forty seven. We hope that you liked it and that you've gotten this far. In which case, look under your seat. There's probably a car there. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just kidding. You can find all the TWIV podcasts at iTunes and also at TWIV.tv. And we would love to get your questions and comments. Send them to TWIV at TWIV.tv. Alan Dove can be found at TurbidPlaque.com and also on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Always a pleasure. And Rich Condit is usually at the University of Florida in Gainesville. But of course, he retired. And he's he's a um, freelance virologist now, and he's he's over in uh, the state of Washington. Thank he you. He can be Rich. found on the road. He can be found on the road. Yeah. Thank you, Rich. Yes, for the time being, an itinerant freelance virologist <laughs> for the next I don't know a couple months, weeks, six weeks, something like that. Oh no, it's going to be a while. Be he's a, while. a virologist gonna, at large. Yeah. So you're gonna, get, are you going to go to Texas eventually? Yeah. So we'll probably get all the way down. to Southern California, and then reach across through uh, Texas. We're connecting all the family dots uh, nice. and spend a fair amount of time in Texas as well before we make a dive. I thought we were going to make it back to Florida by the end of August. I think it's going to be mid-September at least by the time we're back. Well, that's a nice trip. We'll see. Okay. That's yeah, great. Well, thanks for joining us today. We appreciate yes. it. So, uh, always a good time. Is that what I said? Yeah, you do. Good fun. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology. WS. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>